Hello and welcome to Baiju's Exam Prep IES. Welcome to another session of Economy this week, wherein we are taking all the important economy related articles which have appeared in various business related newspapers from 14th of January to 20th of January 2023 and we will have a discussion on all of these articles. Let's begin the discussion. The first and the very important article is RBI dividend to government of India for the current financial year might be lower. Now what is this idea of a RBI dividend? Let's try and understand here. First point, RBI is owned by government of India. There should not be any doubt in your mind regarding this point. RBI is owned by government of India. RBI was nationalized by the government in 1949 and since then the ownership of RBI is with government of India. Second very important point, whenever the companies including RBI by the way, whenever the companies earn profit, part of the profit is given to the owner of the companies and whenever part of the profits are distributed or given to the owner of the companies that is called as dividend. For example, you purchase shares of a company, private sector company or a public sector company and the company has a profits in that year, part of the profit is given to the shareholders who are nothing but the owners of the company and that return given to the owners of the company is called as dividend. Third point, here is a Reserve Bank of India. Reserve Bank of India every year incurs expenditure and also earns revenue. Understand this very carefully. Reserve Bank of India on one side incurs expenditure and on the other hand earns a lot of revenue or income. For example, Reserve Bank of India will incur expenditures in order to pay salaries of the employees, will incur expenditure in order to print currency notes, etc. And on the other hand, RBI will earn income in large number of ways. For example, RBI holds a large amount of foreign assets. On the foreign assets, it earns income. RBI also holds government bonds of government of India. And because they own the government bonds, whenever the government pays interest on it or the coupon on it, RBI also earns money on it. And RBI also provides lot of loans or lending facilities provided on which RBI charges certain rate of interest. For example, repo. So on one side, RBI incurs expenditure and on the other side, RBI is also earning income. Now, if the income is greater than the expenditure, we'll simply call this as a profit for a company. Now, because RBI is not literally a commercial entity, rather than calling this as a profit, we'll call this as a surplus. And remember this, part of the surplus, RBI keeps the part of the surplus with itself and the remaining, it provides it to or gives it to the government of India in the form of dividend. Now, some of you will simply ask me, sir, why does RBI keep part of the profit with itself? The reason is very simple. RBI maintains a large number of accounts or in simple terms funds. And in case of contingency, in case of emergency, RBI would require certain amount of funds. Hence, part of the profits that is earned by RBI, it is keeping it with itself and remaining, it will give it to government of India in the form of a dividend or in the form of surplus distribution. Now, the committee which has recommended in what ratio the surplus has to be kept with itself and given to government of India, the name of the committee is Bimal Jalan Committee. And remember this particular committee name for a very simple reason, very often it is cited in the newspapers. Now, the next very important point, on one side, I like, like I said earlier, RBI earns income and on the other hand, RBI incurs expenditure as well. Now look at the expenditure side, RBI will incur expenditure in the form of printing of the currency notes, payment of the salaries, etc. And apart from this, RBI also 
pays a lot of interest to the banks. Now, why this point is very important? Whenever RBI increases interest rates in the market, sir, what is the interest rate that you are talking about? Simple. RBI provides loans and charges repo rate. But on the other hand, there are other interest rates that are also very much relevant for you. What I am talking about? Reverse repo rate. Under reverse repo rate, the banks will take extra deposits or excess amount of funds that they are holding, deposit with RBI on which RBI will pay interest rate to the banks. And very recently, the most innovative or let's say the another very important tool that has been introduced introduced by RBI is a standing deposit facility SDF. Under SDF also, the banks are allowed to keep deposits with the RBI on which RBI will pay interest rate to the banks. That is standing deposit facility. Now many of you look at both of them and say, sir, both are one and the same. Under reverse repo also, you are saying banks will keep deposit and under SDF also, banks are doing the same thing. How both are different? My dear, please make a note of this. In case of reverse repo, whenever the banks will keep deposits with RBI, RBI has to provide collateral to the banking sector or the banks who are keeping deposits. That concept of security or collateral is absent in the STF. That is very, very important. And this concept of STF has been introduced very recently and banks are actually utilizing the STF now. But anyways, what is the repo rate right now? Repo rate right now is 6.25%. SDF is 6% and the fixed reverse repo rate is 3.35%. That is point number 4. Next point number 5. Let's put all these things in one statement now. In recent times, Reserve Bank of India has increased the interest rate. Repo rate has been hiked. And as a result of this, SDF as well as the reverse repo rate, both are connected to the repo rate. And as a result of this, both the repo, that is the reverse repo as well as SDF, both of them have increased. Which means with the rising interest rate, the amount of interest that is paid by Reserve Bank of India to the banks which keep deposit with RBI, the amount of interest paid has increased. So that's a fact. Make a note of this. Interest paid by RBI has increased. And with the rising interest paid by RBI, what do you think will happen to the expenses incurred by RBI? Expenses incurred by RBI also have increased. And the expenses incurred by RBI rising up means the difference between the expenditure and the income has come down, which ultimately means what? The profit or the surplus earned by RBI has come down. And with the drop or the decline in the surplus or profit earned by RBI, automatically the dividend that is given to the government of India also is expected to come down. So this is a very important discussion. Please remember this. Now, if you look at the amount of dividend that has been given by the RBI to government of India, in the last 10 years, on an average, it comes over 60,000 crore rupees. I repeat, on an average, in the last 10 years, Reserve Bank of India has given more than 60,000 crore rupees dividend to government of India. And the highest amount of dividend that you can see is for the financial year 19, wherein more than 1,70,000 crore worth of dividend was given by Reserve Bank of India to RBI, sorry, Reserve Bank of India to Government of India because Reserve Bank of India accepted the recommendation of Bimal Jalan Committee. And after that, for the financial year 22, there has been a decline in the amount of a dividend that has been announced. That is also on account of higher expenses incurred by the government. It was somewhere in the range of 30,000 crore rupees. And for the current financial year, financial year 23, it is further expected to come down. How much? The experts have not given any information here for a simple reason. Only after the end of the financial year 23, you will realize how much dividend has been announced by RBI to government of India. But that is important for a very simple reason. Government of India, whenever they announce the budgetary estimates for a financial year, 
government of india considers the amount of a dividend or estimates a certain amount of dividend that they want to collect from rbi based on that revenue deficit is decided fiscal deficit is decided etc so that is a very important point to note here so these are the important areas of discussion regarding rbi dividend as well as government of india now based on this there is a question consider the following statements rbi after marking or making provisions for various things has to pay dividend to the union government under section 47 of rbi act statement 1 is correct remember the name of the section rbi earns its profits mainly under repo reverse repo stf omo tools this statement is wrong please be very careful i am marking it wrong because the term profit is involved here on one side when rbi gives a loan earns income that is counted basically as contribution to the profits earned by rbi but if you talk about reverse repo and stf rbi pays interest that will reduce its profit not increase the profit and specifically under open market operation again it's not that both the sides of omo will contribute only the side of uh, or let's say the transaction where rbi will purchase earn let's say coupon on this that is the mainly the area which contributes to the profits earned by rbi so second statement is wrong first statement correct right option for the question will be option a only one is correct second article is regarding group insolvency concept now please be very careful here we already have insolvency and bankruptcy code understand the logic here we already have a concept of insolvency and bankruptcy code but one of the issues related to the insolvency and bankruptcy code is that it doesn't consider the concept of group insolvencies under the insolvency and bankruptcy code it will undertake or it will handle individual corporate or individual companies insolvency not group insolvency now many of you look at it and ask me sir what is the basic idea of an individual corporate and group insolvency let me give a very simple example imagine here is an entity or let's say a, a owner or a promoter and this promoter owns multiple companies multiple entities any example of this jp group of industries adani group of industries videocon which was there very recently in the newspaper precisely for insolvency itself so have a look at this there is only one group of promoter here and this group or let's say this entity owns multiple subsidiaries or multiple companies like this right now imagine this is company a b c and d imagine company a has taken a loan it is unable to repay the loan then company a insolvency can be conducted under ibc but what is the idea of a group insolvency the issue here is that multiple times we say that these subsidiaries or let's say entities are connected to the common owner and most of the times ownership is same the type of operation that is conducted is connected to all of them financial relations are there between all of them there is a performance connection in simple terms in all of them put in a nutshell legally all these are different companies but all of them are working as a single organism that is all of them are interconnected their performance profits financials all of them are interconnected owner is the same now this this becomes a problem for a very simple reason what if one of the company is located outside india and one more company takes a loan within india incurs a loss is unable to repay the loan now because all of these are interconnected i repeat because all of these are interconnected it's a simple same group of companies like this there is a concept of group insolvency which is yet to be introduced in india now some of you ask me sir why should there be a group insolvency so that the whole group of companies is held accountable there is a transparency in the system the insolvency and bankruptcy code can take up the group and conduct the insolvency resolution in a very swift manner etc 
And many of the times what happens is, imagine this company is set up outside India in a particular country or a jurisdiction which will basically shield the company from the insolvencies outside the jurisdiction that leads to complexity in the system. And looking at all of this only, I hope you understand this, looking at all of this only at the international level, there is this particular concept of UNCITRAL model law on enterprise group insolvency MLEGI. Now what is this UN CITRAL or UNCITRAL? It basically refers to United Nations Commission on International Trade and Law. Basically one of the organs of United Nations. United Nations or this organ of United Nations set up the concept of a model law on enterprise group insolvency which proposed to conduct insolvency of group of companies like this and this concept was accepted by United Nations couple of years ago. But in case of India even today group insolvency is not there. So in order to address this the Minister of Corporate Affairs has set up a committee which was headed by the earlier or a former secretary Mr. K.P. Krishnan and the name of the committee is Cross-Border Insolvency Regulations Committee. Now this committee has already provided the recommendation to Government of India in December 2021 and these recommendations have been made public very very recently and the feedback has been asked by Government of India. Now what has been recommended by this committee? This committee says that to begin with, to start with, we can have a group insolvency of those companies which are present only in India. And we should not include financial service providers because already they are present under the insolvency and bankruptcy code. So we should start with the group insolvency resolution or the insolvency resolution for group of companies to begin with in India or only in India which are present, later we can go for cross-border insolvency resolution adoption. And apart from this, whenever you are talking about a group insolvency, if there are certain companies which are doing very well, which are basically performing very well, they are repaying the loan, you should not be including those in a part of group when the insolvency resolution is done. But imagine there are five companies, all the five have taken loans and they have incurred losses then it is better to group all the five, basically all the subsidiaries of the same company, group all the five, conduct a common insolvency resolution. Another very important recommendation that has been given by the committee is that we should have a very, com very uh, let's say, good definition or a very broad definition of what comprises of a group of companies. So these are some of the very important recommendations yet to be implemented. Now the report has been made public by the government. Next article, the Ministry of Shipping, Ports and Waterways very recently has announced or has notified rules for setting up of Major Ports Adjudicatory Board. I will start using the short form, Major Port Adjudicatory Board, MPAB, don't be confused. Now what is this idea of a Major Ports Adjudicatory Board? Let's try and understand this. In India, we divide all the ports into major and non-major ports. Either you can call them as a non-major or even minor ports. Now, as of the latest information, there are 12 major ports. Now, please understand the idea here. We call these as a major ports for a very simple reason. These come under the guidance or let's say regulation of the central government. Whereas if you talk about the non-major ports, these are under the regulations of the respective state governments. Now focus on the major ports here. The major ports earlier, central government in order to regulate the major ports had one law. Major Ports Act or Major Port Trust Act of 1963. Under the Major Port Act of 1963, government of India basically set up various uh, trusts, understand this, at each of the major ports, the trusts were appointed and it was basically the trust which would oversee the functioning of the major ports. But apart from this major port trust, there was one more authority which was appointed or let's say set up by government during 1990s, the authority of Tariff Authority TAMP, T 
TAMP that is a tariff authority for major ports now what was the role of the tariff authority for major ports within these major ports various types of services that is port related services either by the government agencies or government owned entities or the private sector through PPP would be provided now whenever these kind of services are provided tariffs have to be determined for these services and now these tariffs would be decided by this authority tariff authority for major ports but there was an issue issue in the sense the TAMP when I say the TAMP would decide please understand the trust or let's say the private players would take these numbers go to the TAMP and it would be the TAMP which would approve these tariff rates many of the times whenever there is basically a decision related to a tariff fixation there would be a friction between the private sector players or the private operators along with the government authority that is basically the TAMP and because we were supposed to go to that is the major players were supposed to go to the TAMP get the approval from the TAMP there would be a long time period that would be consumed so citing all of this government of India in 2020 introduced a new bill that is major port authorities bill of 2020 which was passed and implemented by the government notified by the government in 2021 now what are the very important points regarding this particular new act under the major port authorities act of 2021 rather than simply setting up of a sitting a setting up of a trust in the major port now government called these as major port authorities now many of you will ask me sir what do you mean by this authority here i will not get into the the details of it but suffice to understand that unlike earlier situation this would not be a trust it would be an authority now and a large amount of decision making was given to these authorities the composition was changed the power structure was changed what kind of functions these authorities would be providing all of this was changed by the government now there was one more authority TAMP now should the authorities that is the port authorities should they approach TAMP to get the tariffs notified what government said was we are going to restructure and revamp the whole concept of a tariff structure here that is rather than you approaching TAMP we are going to remove TAMP right subsume the TAMP under a new authority that would be basically major ports adjudicatory board so in simple terms TAMP has been subsumed now otherwise you can simply say has been discontinued and in place of the TAMP now there is a major port authorities adjudicatory board major port adjudicatory board now what is the role of a major port adjudicatory board before that composition is simple there will be three people in the adjudicatory board that will be one plus two the one will be right basically the chairman of uh, the or the president of this adjudicatory board it will have the powers on the lines of the civil court and this one person will be the retired chief justice of uh, supreme court or any high court and these two will be the expert appointed of course by a committee again set up by government of india as per the act of major port 2021 now this major port adjudicatory board we look after the tariff decisions or let's say if there is any dispute in the PPP or the tariffs etc within the major ports now rather than going to the TAMP the authorities are given the right to decide the tariff what kind of services the uh, let's say the conditions of contract signed between the private player with the authority etc if there is any dispute in regards to any of this it will be taken up by major port adjudicatory board and the reference will be either provided by the major port authorities or by the central government so with all of this what we can expect is the tariff decision making will be much more simple much more transparent much more efficient and this is important for a very simple reason if you remember earlier i showed you the picture of major as well as the non-major ports in india and over a period of time what has happened is because of the lack in terms of 
tariff structure or delays in the tariff structure and one more issue has been tariffs not basically reflecting the market situation the major ports have constantly kept on losing the market share to the non-major ports such as private ports in India and to address this issue now government of India changed the structure which is expected to change how the tariffs are decided and implemented for major ports so these are the points of discussion here based on this I have given a question consider the following statements major ports are regulated under the major port trust act of 1963 wrong it is a major ports act of 2021 now tariffs for the services provided at all the ports in India is decided by the TAMP this statement is also wrong so both the statements are wrong right option for the question will be option D neither one nor two next RB has mooted that is basically proposed expected loss based model for provisioning by banks very technical concept but the terminology can be asked by UPSC follow the discussion here now here is a bank understand the process here here is a bank the bank has given a loan and the concept of a loan is what a loan is an asset for a bank because it generates lot of income for the bank but what if I were to say that some of the loans which are issued by the bank they will not be able to recover the loan that is the bank has given a loan it is unable to recollect the loan in simple terms what if the loan becomes a non-performing asset NPA and traditionally what is the definition of NPA if a borrower doesn't repay the loan for 90 days that is from the due date 90 days are over borrower is not repaying the loan that account is classified as a non-performing asset now have a look at this right now the concept that the banks are following is they follow a model called as incurred loss based model incurred loss based model from incurred loss based model RBI has now proposed a new type of a model which is called as expected loss based model now what is the basic difference between both of them follow the process here a bank has given a loan for 90 days the borrower doesn't repay this is classified as an NPA under the incurred loss based model once the account becomes an NPA from the revenue that the bank is going to collect part of the revenue will be kept aside so that the losses can be adjusted for right this process is called as a provisioning is it okay I'll repeat it again a loan is given loan is not returned becomes an NPA 90 days from the due date if the amount is not repaid it is classified as an NPA so once a loan is classified as NPA to adjust to take care of the losses that could be incurred by the bank because of the NPA from the revenue that they are generating that is the money that they are collecting part of the money will be kept aside in order to address the losses this concept is called as a provisioning norm and this is important for a very simple reason understand the logic here if a bank is collecting 100 crore rupees and let's say out of 100 crore rupees we keep aside 10 crore rupees for provisioning which means the bank has more money to lend now but on the other hand what if I increase it from 10 crore rupees to 20 crore rupees a simple question think of it don't you think if I increase it from 10 crore rupees to 20 crore rupees the amount of earnings of the banks or the amount of money that has to be kept aside by the bank will go up and as a result of this the lending activity of the bank would be affected now that is a very important point why you will understand now so right now we are following a model of what incurred loss based provisioning norm wherein loan becomes an NPA you start making provisions but RBI says a better methodology which is accepted at the international level that is even proposed and implemented under the IFRS International Financial Reporting Standards model is not incurred loss based model rather expected loss based model what is this idea of expected loss, loss based model 
unlike the current system where we are where we are waiting for the accountant to become an NPA, under the new system that has been proposed, the banks are going to estimate the amount of losses they are going to incur. I hope you understand the difference here. Here we are waiting for the account to become an NPA. Now under the new system it is not going to happen like that. We are going to shift to a new system where we are going to estimate how much loans are going to be incurring losses or how much losses the banks are going to incur because of the loans. And based on that, based on the requirement of a bank, we are going to start making provisions. And it is expected that with change to a new system, the amount of provisioning would also start to be higher. It would be much higher compared to what provisioning is being done by the banking sector now. And that is a precise reason some of the experts are saying, if we shift from the current system to the new system, the amount of provisions would increase, which would affect the lending activity of the banking sector. So this is the concept that is being proposed by the government, uh, being proposed by RBI. Again, not yet implemented, but definitely yes, RBI is thinking of introducing this. Next article, India-China trade deficit crosses 100 billion for the first time. Important, please be very, very careful. Now, what is this whole idea? Trade deficit simply means the value of exports that we have done is lower than the value of imports that we have done. Just a hypothetical idea here. If you have exported 100 billion dollar worth of, right, let's say exports and you have imported of value, let's say 150 billion dollar, then the 50 billion dollar difference is outflow of dollars because of higher import. This we basically call it as a trade deficit. This is referred to as trade deficit. And one of the concerns that the government of India has been raising for a very, very long time period now is that India generally has a trade deficit, point one and point two. Specifically with China, our trade deficit has been higher and has been becoming bigger and bigger from year to the next year. Is it okay? I'll repeat it. The government of India has been flagging the issue of trade deficit one, but specifically within the trade deficit, the trade deficit that India has with China has been higher and has been expanding over a period of time. Now, some of you will ask me, sir, any proof of it? Let me show it to you. This is how much imports we do from China. And some of you look at the graph and say, sir, should I remember it? Absolutely no. Don't buy hard the graphs. UPSC will not ask you the graph. But what is important to note here is simply this. The amount of imports that we do from China have been increasing in the last couple of years. And traditionally, these have been rising up. Now, some of you look at it and say, sir, but in some of the years they have declined. Is it not a good trend? My dear, if you look at the years where there has been a decline, it is because of the pandemic. Not because we wanted to reduce imports, it is because of the pandemic which affected economic activity. But traditionally, if you see or the general trend, if you see, there has been a growth in the value of imports that we do from China. And this is specifically from China. That is one point. And if you look at out of the total imports, how much imports we are doing from China at one point of time, that is basically in the financial year 15 and 16, if you see that it hit around 17% of the imports, which means out of the total imports, one sixth or more than one sixth of the total imports that we did was from China. But in recent times or the data that has been provided here for 2022, it is basically 14.2%. Nevertheless, that is also very, very high. That is approximately around one sixth of the total imports. On the other hand, if you talk about exports from India, right, exports from India generally, right, are on a lower level. Uh, and of course, it has to be true. You, are, you have a trade deficit simply means what your exports are much higher than the value of imports. And as a percentage of the total exports that we have done, how much we have exported to China, it is somewhere around 3 to 4 percent. In the range of somewhere around 3 to 4 percent. Not a very, very high amount of imports. Now, based on this only, do not come to any conclusion. I hope you understand. Sir, exports account for around, I'm sorry, imports account for around 14 percent of the imports. Exports account for around 3 percent of the total exports. Do not come to a conclusion based on this only. Why? 
for a very simple reason what is the value of imports is a different compared to what is the value of exports are done from India I hope you understand if the bases are different then automatically the outcome will be completely different in fact the gap between the imports that we do from China to exports that we do from China is very very large and for the first time ever it has crossed more than 100 billion dollars that is in simple data terms the total amount of trade that has happened between India and China is more than 135 billion dollar but the value of imports that we have done is basically 100 billion dollar more than the value of exports that we have done to China and this has happened for the first time ever any concern of course yes if you have a huge amount of a trade deficit of course it's a cause of concern because the value means or a higher value of imports means the dollars are going out of India that is one second we are import dependent on one or very few of the exporters in the international market and the issue related to import dependency is very well explained as to what happened during the pandemic and if there is a friction between these two countries that that has that we have experienced in the last couple of years you know what could be the impact on the trade because of that that is the second issue now third point some of you will be looking at all of the discussion and thinking and wondering sir why why is that from China we import more but our exports are lesser answer is very simple here one it's not that we don't export to China we export to China but the kind of a goods that we export to China are very very narrow and generally are associated with primary types of goods that is uh, the one which involves uh, right uh, very important raw materials for example iron ore and concentrates petroleum oils right organic chemicals etc etc right that is one issue second issue we export to China but there are certain important uh, tariff walls or non-tariff walls which have been erected that is the trade barriers which have been put in place by China especially in certain sectors where India is a very good exporter producer as well as the exporter for example IT and ITES sector services or service exports third one if you look at the China's manufacturing they basically produce in large quantities as a result of which their exports are very very cheaper and because their products are very very cheaper India ends up importing lot of these commodities into the domestic market so have a look at all these factors you will realize because of these factors our exports are lower our imports are continuously rising and this is the reason why the trade deficit between India and China has widened for the first time ever and has crossed more than 100 billion dollars and apart from this also have a look at how what kind of products we import what kind of goods we import from China majority of them are electronic integrated circuits telephone sets and parts semiconductor devices parts for radio and TV right etc etc so these are some of the very important points that you need to make a note of regarding the rise in the trade deficit that India has with China next article property tax collection many of the local bodies urban local bodies have started adopting technology in order to improve the amount of taxes through property or let's say property taxes revenue collection now what is the argument here let's go point by point first point there is no denying in the fact that urban local bodies that is specifically let's say municipalities have to collect a lot of their own revenues so that they can develop infrastructure as per World Bank report, around 40% of the India's population is going to reside in the urban bodies or urban areas. That comes out to be around 600 million, which will put a lot of pressure on the infrastructure which is developed by the civic bodies. So point one, there is going to be a huge amount of population which is going to reside, hence you need infrastructure. Point two, if you want to develop infrastructure, you need to spend money there should not be any doubt regarding this they need to spend a lot of money but the problem starts arising here itself that is more than 75 percent of the funds which are spent by the local bodies in order to develop infrastructure 
they are dependent either by the central government that is a fund flow from the central government as well as from the state government. More than 5% comes from the private sector at the local level and only around 15% plus it is their own revenue. I hope you understand. Out of the total money spent by these urban, urban local bodies, only around 15% is their own revenue. Most of it they are dependent. The money which will come from the central government as well as the state government. I will give a best example. 14th Finance Commission has recommended around 2.9 lakh crore worth of funds to the local bodies. 15th Finance Commission has recommended around 4.3 to 4.4 lakh crore rupees worth of funds to be given to the urban local bodies. So most of the funds which will be spent by them to develop infrastructure comes from the center as well as states. Only a part of it, around 15% is their own revenue. And within their own revenue, if you try to dissect, a large chunk of it actually comes in the form of property taxes. But the concern here is that even the amount of property taxes they are raising and collecting, it is not sufficient, it is not efficient. Why? I'll give a very simple example. Imagine here is a house which is constructed. What is the valuation of the house? What is the correct size or the, let's say, value of the house? It is not registered. As a result of which, how much will be the property tax collected that is demanded as well as collected will always be lower. Many of these constructions are illegal in nature, which means the municipality doesn't have any record of this construction. Because they don't have a record illegally constructed, they will not be able to raise and collect property taxes from such, right, let's say, infrastructure. So what has been done now? Many of these municipalities have started using technology and they have started raising more and more property taxes which will contribute to their own source of revenue. So any example of the municipality that you are talking of? Best example, remember this, you can use it in UPC mains if at all a question is asked by UPC regarding, let's say, the financial problems at the lowest level. That is a third year. Raipur, that is one example. Greater Chennai Municipal Corporation, GCC, is another example. So what they have done, again, you don't have to specifically remember individual municipalities or individual corporations here. Remember two names and generalize it. What they have done is simple. They have used technology such as the mapping, geographical information systems, the cloud and analytics, data collection, drone surveys, etc. And by using kind of technology like this or a group of technologies like this, they have found out how many buildings are there, what is the assessment, what is the data stored for this kind of a building in different systems that they have. They have basically created one system to look at all of it now. They have found out how much of the values are under assessed, lower assessment, wrong assessment is done or no assessment is done, etc. And using all of these technologies, now they have put together a consolidated data and they have started raising a lot of property tax demand on all of these buildings. And as a result of this, just look at the data that is given here. According to the data that is provided in the article, the Raipur corporation itself has able to register a 53% rise in the registered properties and the amount of property tax that has been collected has increased by 96% and that's a huge amount of growth in the tax revenues. So in simple terms, technology has been utilized, database has been upgraded, updated and as a result of this, property tax demands have increased, so have been the collections. So these are certain important points regarding this article. Please make a note of it. Next article, Oxfam report. Very, very important. Why? If you look at the syllabus of GS paper 3, there is, again, mains-based syllabus I'm talking about. There is one concept which is referred as inclusive growth. And when you discuss inclusive growth, one of the issues that you generally come across is there is a huge amount of wealth inequality that is existing. And if you want to achieve inclusive growth, you will have to address this issue of the income or, or let's say the other form of it or the other 
side or another concept related to it, the wealth inequality that is existing in the Indian economy. Now, what does the Oxfam report say about the wealth inequality in India? Point number one, the wealth inequality oh, uh, uh, compared to the pre-pandemic, now the wealth inequality has actually increased. I repeat, right? so wealth inequality which was existing before pandemic, it is still existing after pandemic. But the gap that was there after pandemic, it has widened. What do you mean by this? Again, please don't be confused between income and wealth. Wealth is basically the sum total of all the assets that you have. Income is nothing but how much money you are earning. For example, a person has a, let's say, right, a certain number of shares, certain number of buildings, and a salary of 1 crore rupees. If I talk about income, I'll count only 1 crore rupees. But if I talk about wealth, I'll be counting all of it. So basically wealth is all the assets that are held by a person. So the wealth inequality post pandemic rather narrowing has actually widened in India. How to prove that? Remember the data. Please remember it. You can use this to represent that there is issue of wealth inequality and we need to address it to achieve inclusive growth in the Indian economy. Wealthiest 10% of the total population in India. Right, the top 10% wealthiest population control how much? 72% of the total wealth. So the top 10%, again some of you ask, sir, what do you mean by top 10%? Imagine there are four people, A, B, C, D. Right, just imagine there are four people. If I arrange them in descending order of most wealthiest person to the, right, the poorest person, assuming it is in the same sequence, A, B, C, D. Now, if I say top 25% of the population, I'll be counting A. If I say bottom 50% of the population, I'll be counting C and D. So, in the same way, if you arrange the overall population in India from the most wealthiest to the most poorest, the top 10% of the population has a control over more than 72% of the total wealth. Top 5% owns more than 62% amount of the wealth. Right, have a look at the data here. And this has actually widened post-pandemic. Why this a problem? Problem because on one side, the amount of wealth that is held by the people, top 1%, top 10%, etc. has increased. One. Second, India even today houses the largest number of poor people in the international market. That is, if you compare the poverty numbers across all the countries, the number of poor people in India is 228 million. That is 22 crore plus. More than 22 crore people in India are poor. And the number of billionaires on the other hand have actually increased. From 102 in 2020 to 166 in 2022. So on one side, the wealth held by the rich people has increased. The billionaires in India have increased. But even then, India houses the largest number of poor people in the globe. Now, some of you will say, what is the problem with it? Rich have become richer, poor are still remaining poor. What is the problem? The problem itself is a statement. That is, despite implementing so many reforms, government of India has implemented multiple reforms over a period of time. For example, 11th five-year plan, central theme was related to inclusive growth. 12th 5-year plan, again inclusive growth. And if you talk about any policy of government of India, one or the other way, government of India would be promoting employment of generation. I have to understand this. Or employment generation. So the argument is on one side, government of India says, I want to eradicate poverty. I want to create more and more jobs. But on the other hand, the number of poor people is very high. Rich are still becoming very rich. That is the concern here. That is the concern. And have a look at this. Top 1% of the population owns more than 40% of the wealth. Bottom 50%. Bottom 50% of the population owns just 3% of the wealth. Which means top 1% population earns 13 times or has more than 13 times the amount of wealth that is owned by the half of the population in India. 
So the kind of wealth inequality that is existing in India is very, very huge. We need to address it. Right. So these are some of the very important observations that have been provided in the Oxfam report. And the last article for the day, Padho Pardesh scheme or Padho Pardesh scheme has been discontinued by Ministry of Minority Affairs. Now in this article, just factual information is provided and you need to remember that more than sufficient. And why the scheme has been discontinued, there is no clarification given by the government. But what are the important points here? First point, the Ministry of Minority Affairs has discontinued the scheme. This scheme, understand this, under this, people or let's say the students from the minority communities, whenever they went abroad, right, and would basically get educated there, the identified students or the beneficiaries under the scheme, they would get interest subvention. That is in simple terms, right, under this, the loans that were taken, on that the government used to provide interest subsidy. What do you mean by this, sir? Imagine here is a student X, who is a beneficiary under the scheme, minority community student, of course. The student X will go abroad, get education, but to get educated abroad, the student has taken an education loan. On the education loan, the student is supposed to provide interest. Now, this interest under the scheme would be paid by government of India. Simple. The interest would be paid by government of India. That is point number one. Point number two is every student from minority community eligible for it? Of course, no. The eligibility condition was the student, either an employed student or their parents, put together the total amount of salary or earnings per year should not be more than 6 lakh rupees. Per annum, the earnings should not be more than 6 lakh rupees. And second, 35%, more than one third of these seats which were selected to be provided with interest subsidy here, more than one third were reserved for girl candidates or girl students. Third very important point here, it was the Canada, I'm sorry, Canara Bank. It was the Canara Bank, which was the nodal bank for the implementation of the Padho Pardesh scheme. Right, so these are certain important points. Apart from this, again I'm saying, don't worry about why it has been discontinued because even the Ministry of Minority Affairs has not given any clarification regarding this. But can UPSC ask a question in the prelims based on the scheme? Of course, yes, they can ask you this question. So these are the various articles as well as the questions related to these articles which have appeared in various newspapers from 14th to 20th January 2023. If you like the initiative, hit the like button, provide your valuable comments in the section below and if you are ready to subscribe to Baiju's exam prep IAS, kindly do it now. Thank you, have a great day.